You know, I was, uh, I, I've been praying the last couple of weeks, ever since Resurrection Sunday, which is two weeks ago, about, about what, what the Lord would have us get into next. Not that I was blank. I mean, I could, I could preach in any different direction, but I'm like, God, what do you want? And as I was, uh, I was thinking about that, um, uh, really, it, it kind of came through last weekend with our guest speaker in and some of the things that he said that I, I've shared it before that sometimes you come up to, to uh, Resurrection Sunday, you've got Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, and you know, w- one Sunday you're, you're like, rah, rah, Jesus is in, and the next Sunday, rah, rah, Jesus is alive. But there's a lot of things happened in between that week. I mean, there was, there was conversations, there was meals, there was, there was uh, denials, there was, um, <clears throat> um, um, you, you know, there was uh, crucifixion, there was beatings, there was all kinds of things that took place there on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, and sometimes we just miss all that that took place that's so vitally important for us to understand. We go from Sunday to Sunday. And what the Lord spoke to me is, <clears throat> now it's time to go from Sunday to Sunday again. But this is going to be spread out in six weeks. Sunday of the resurrection till Sunday, the day of Pentecost. So it's not going to happen within a week. It's going to happen over 50 days. So that's kind of where we're going. We're going to pick up in John chapter 20. What happened on the evening Jesus was raised to life that morning? What started that evening and then went all the way through? Next week we'll be in chapter 21 of John and then two weeks after that, I'm going to be out. We've got Mother's Day coming. I'll pick up again and then jump into Acts chapter 1. And then Acts chapter 2 will put us on Pentecost Sunday. So we're going from Sunday to Sunday again, just in a, a different way, to try to cover what uh, the disciples, um, uh, what happened and how uh, Jesus prepared them for, um, for what he had in mind. Can I uh, you grab my water there for me? All right, so we're going to dive in here today, as soon as I get a little liquid. Yeah, don't you love allergies? (laughs) I don't, I I declare I don't have them. (laughs) So the title of today's message is Breathe On and Born Again breathed on and born again. I'm going to talk about something unpleasant starting out. I'm going to talk about bad breath. <laughs> Usually you don't know you have bad breath, but you know that other people do. And then you get, you know, you get into conversations and sometimes you encounter people that are close talkers. You're, you're, you're kind of, they're closing in on you and you're like backing up and they keep closing in and you're like, whew, I need some relief here. And then you go to somebody's house and they got an 85 pound lap dog. It has horrible breath, and they're all over you. Ha! Ah, happy to see you. Oh, my goodness. Bad breath. Not necessarily a pleasant thing. But then there's also good breath. I mean, you've been around somebody just after they popped in a mint, and you're like, you smell that aroma, like, wow, that smells good. Or, or you know, you encounter your spouse after you both brush your teeth, and you're like, wow, that's really pleasant. That's really good. Or somebody take a, took a sip of flavored coffee, and you smell that aroma coming out, you're like, wow, it's really good, you know? So we have both the bad and the good. Now what we're going to discover here this morning is that the initial time that the disciples were born again happened when Jesus breathed on them. It's very different from how we think about being born again, but that's how it happened initially. And we're going to discover that today as we jump into the text. So let's, let's look at John chapter 20. I'm going to start at verse 19. And uh, verse 19, again, brings us to the, um, I'm not advertising Fiji water, it just happens to be out there, but anyhow. (laughs) So let's turn it this way, there, there we go. This is a non-advertising message. (laughs) Here we go, John chapter 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood Uh, among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive one another's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. 
Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless the nail marks in his hands, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen yet believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book, but they were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Isn't that exciting? That's for sure. So the born again experience happened by breath. I'm going to step over here and catch a tissue before, uh, never mind. I won't go into any more detail. I'm just going to catch a tissue, all right? So as we, as we look at uh, what happened here, we discover <clears throat> that um, <clears throat> the first disciples were born again by breath. And we see that in verse 22. Uh, this, this um, um, in the same way, um, we, uh, I'll, just, I'll just skip that and, and we'll get, get into it later. But verse 19 lets us know the day and time of when this took place. It's the evening after the morning that Jesus was raised from the dead. And that's the, that's the time period in which we're in. And it says that he breathed on them and that they received eternal life. Then we get to verse 20. And again, Jesus verified the 10 disciples were there. We don't know if anybody else was there, but at least the 10 were there. Judas is dead and Thomas is missing. And Jesus comes in and he, um, he, he shows them his hands and his side. Luke records the feet. You say, well, why is that significant that he actually showed them his hands and his feet? What I begin to recognize is that nobody saw Jesus raised from the dead. No human being saw him raised from the dead. They saw him born. Obviously, Mary Joseph was there when he was born, right? They saw him crucified. There were, there were John and Mary, and, and uh, you know, it's, Scripture records people were standing around as he was being crucified. They saw him beaten. They saw him crucified. They saw him die. They saw him give up his spirit, and he's gone. So human beings saw him born, they saw him die, they carried him to the tomb and put his body there. The men are named that did that. So human beings actually put his dead body in the tomb, but no human being saw Jesus raised from the dead. So when he appeared, they were like, what is the evidence that it's him? And so he showed them. He had to keep the nail prints in his hands. He had to keep where the sword pierced his side. He had to keep where the nails went into his feet in order for them to verify that it was him that was alive because nobody else saw him alive. That was the only proof that he could give at that point. Now, he gave other proofs as he continued to talk with them over the 40 days. It's because he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive but no human being saw him raised from the dead. Therefore, he needed to verify that he was alive so that he could believe. I think that's a, uh, you know, important to understand that scars tell stories, don't they? I don't know how many scars you have on your body, but probably every one of those scars tells a story. Sometimes I'll do that in a small group meeting. I'll say, tell me your scar, show me your scars, if it's appropriate, <laughs> and tell me your story. You know, I have, I have two scars on my kneecaps. 
And the story behind that, when I was a kid, like five or six year old kid, I was jumping cinder blocks in the garden. And so obviously I missed a couple of times and my kneecaps have scars there from where I missed and hit the cinder block and they're all bloody. So two scars there, I can show you those. I have hernia scars. Uh, you won't see those. Um, my wife and my doctor are the only ones that see those. <laughs> I've got a scar on my, uh, my right uh, calf where I was using a chainsaw and uh, probably a teenager, a little bit crazy, but a song through the wood and it didn't stop, went through my pants and went into my calf leg. Just a little bit. Yeah, you're getting, uh, take, yeah, Michelle. Yeah, it, so anyhow, I have a scar from that. And, and so Jesus had his scars because it told the story of who he was and, uh, and, and, it, and it let people know that it was actually him. And he used that then to verify and uh, for people to know who he was. And just in the same way, we have our scars and a story. Jesus has his as well. I want to <clears throat> just highlight a couple of things there. The kingdom of God cannot be entered unless someone is born again. And uh, that's, uh, that's really what Jesus taught. He verified that all the way down through his teaching. In fact, we jump back to earlier chapter in John. John 3, 3, uh, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom unless he is born again. Satan blinds the minds of people. In fact, he, he lets people think that they can, uh, you know, be at one with God and not be born again. That's what Satan says. You can be at one with God and not be born again. You can be okay, but Jesus is clear and says, absolutely not. You must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. Later on in John 7, 38 and 39, he records when this will take place. He said, whoever believes in me, as scriptures has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. Now, this is the moment that Jesus had been glorified. So therefore, we're at, in a new era. We're in a new place. Up until that time, Jesus had not been glorified. Therefore, the Spirit was around people but never lived in people. Then after Jesus rose from the dead then it gives opportunity for the Spirit to come live in people. So this is the moment when the disciples became born again. Sunday night after Jesus rose from the dead, it said that Jesus initially breathed on them. What did that look like? I mean, did he breathe over top of them? Did he go straight in the face? I mean, <laughs> you're like, what did that look like? I don't know. I, I am aware there's an ancient tradition in the Middle East that when a patriarch of the family was about to pass on, he would bring the family together and he would line them up in a room and the father would breathe over top of each family member to let his breath settle over them as a way of passing on the mantle of who he was over into the family that they could carry it on. So there was this ancient tradition that I'm aware of. Maybe it happened something of that way, but yet uh, we don't really know whether he breathed over top of them or breathed. But that was the moment when he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they were born again at that moment. Now, the other interesting fact is that word breath is the same word that's used when God breathed into Adam as a lump of clay. So therefore, it's very appropriate that the God that started the human race and breathed into him would be the same God, the second Adam, or rather the last Adam. I don't prefer the second Adam because that insinuates it's a third, fourth, and fifth. There, no, there's not. There's a first and a last. So Jesus is the last Adam. It would be appropriate, since he's starting a new race, that he breathe into them this new life to be born again. That was the initial time. It started with breath. Now we're going to learn how we believe that's different. Thomas actually exhibited that, but it started with breath. The same breath that God breathed into Adam is the same breath that Jesus then, the last Adam, breathed into his disciples as first fruits or representatives of the human race, and they became born again. Now some scholars would say 
that uh, this was John's rendition of the uh, Holy Spirit being poured out on the church. Well, I've got two issues with that, that the text is very clear. The first issue is that it is Sunday night after he rose from the dead. Scripture's clear, Sunday night after he rose from the dead. It wasn't 50 days from now when Pentecost took place. So that's the first issue I have. The second issue is that Jesus taught the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out after he physically left and went back up to heaven. So therefore, there's two that the text is very clear about. This couldn't have been John's understanding of Pentecost. It had to be the moment that they were born again. Then they're in preparation for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, but they first had to be born again. And this is what is taking place initially with the breath, and then secondly, in, uh, in believing. Now that's how... how um, um, Thomas came in to being born again. He believed, but the ten came, became born again by receiving the breath of God. Um, <clears throat> so the second thing is that the, the subsequent way, as I mentioned, number two, is that we are born again by belief. Now this is how Thomas became a believer. Um, we see in 24 through 26, again, I read it earlier, how, uh, how Thomas, again, he declared that unless he sees the nail prints, and unless he sees the side, uh, he said, I I'm not going to believe. And so Jesus immediately came in and gave him convincing proofs. Now, it doesn't say that Thomas actually touched him. Jesus gave an invitation to actually touch him, but it doesn't say he did. But it was enough proof that he said, my Lord and my God. And now, now, interesting, those statements are personal, aren't they? He, he doesn't say, you are the Lord and you are the God. He says, my Lord and my God. That's a born-again person. In other words, you're personal in my life at this point. And so Thomas became born again by belief, which is the way that we become born again. Um, you know, again, initially it was by breath, and then subsequently it was by belief, in the same way, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, initially it was tongues of fire. We'll get to that in about six weeks. And then subsequently, after that, it was the laying on of hands or preaching or prophesying. The Holy Spirit was poured out on people in different ways, but it never came in tongues of fire like it did initially the first time. That was the initial, and then after that, it came in a different way. So again, they were born again through breath, and then... Thomas was born again through belief, and we are born again through belief in the same way that Thomas was again believed Jesus. And it's an amazing way to, again, to begin to understand. Now, I marvel that when Jesus came into the room that day, it's not recorded that he caught up and, and, and figured out what Thomas's problem was. I, I think that because he told the first 10 disciples, they looked at his hands and his side, that I think he just automatically went to Thomas because he wasn't there and said, look at my hands and look at my side, not even knowing what Thomas said earlier that he would not believe unless he was shown proof. I was, uh, uh, first service, I, I was talking about a couple that, uh, that they were in first service and come here and they were at a, a previous church and they were going through the membership class of that church and and uh, so th they were about three quarters of the way through, and, and the pastor said, uh, I just want to be clear, we will not have any, any spiritual manifestations in our church on Sunday morning. And it so startled this gal, she was like, wait a minute, did I just hear correctly? And so I went and raised, said, said uh, did you just say that there will not be any demonstration of the Holy Spirit on Sunday mornings and together? And he said, yes, that's true. And she looked at her husband and said, we're out of here. The next Sunday... They found crossroads. And as I, I have no idea what I was preaching on, but I specifically said that we, were, we are open to and welcome the gifts of the Holy Spirit on Sunday morning. So the very thing that she heard wasn't happening is the very thing that she heard will happen, and they're a part of us today. Now, let me just stop. I'm not knocking the fact that that church is at that place in their doctrine. I'm only using an example to say that when you're looking for proof of a certain area and you're seeking God for that, he'll give it to you in the right time, in the right timing, and in the right way. 
That's what I'm used that example for. And it's exactly what was said wouldn't happen. I said exactly what will happen. And so that's what Thomas needed. He needed proof. And Jesus walked in and said, here it is. And in believing that, he became born again. So what an amazing, amazing uh, journey. Now, in this, uh, this born-again thing, uh, born-again experience, we must settle that it's necessary. We must settle that to be born again is necessary. And again, we jump back to earlier chapters of John and his teaching. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says in John chapter 3, 5 through 7, he says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. And then verse 12, that same chapter. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? There's, you know, when, when spiritual matters come up, there's different ways to describe what's going on. And those that don't believe, they may think it's odd or rare or, or just maybe random. They, they, they're like, I, I don't know how to describe that. But those that are born again understand that that's normal with our God. That somebody's sick and we lay hands and pray on them and they get well, they recover. Or we intercede for somebody and they change their mind about what they're doing and turn around and follow God. See, people looking on that aren't born again would go, wow, that's strange, that's weird. I mean, I see it, but how does that happen? But those of us that believe, yeah, that's normal. That's how my God works. He takes impossible situations. He changes it around. That's normal for us, but it's not normal for the world. The world now is, you know, depending upon where they're at, it's in fear. What's going to happen? And, and is, the, is the world going to blow itself up? I say, absolutely not. Because the world didn't create the world. God created the world. Therefore, he's the one that's going to be responsible for, you know, however this earth goes. He's going to be in charge. In fact, uh, I was reminded of, I was praying this morning about the situation uh, in, in the earth. And I was reminded of Psalm chapter 2 where it says the kings, they rival against one another. And they think I'm in charge and I'm going to conquer. And it says God sits in heaven and laughs. <laughs> He thinks that's funny. <laughs> Everybody else is in fear, but God says, that's funny <laughs> because I'm in charge. And that's, that's when we're born again. We, we come into that level of understanding and we walk in peace and hope and faith. But those that aren't born again walk in fear and discouragement and, and, and like uh, 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 unknown of what's going to happen. So it's a beautiful thing when you get born again because the, the world comes to to, uh, alive in a different way and, and you have life in ways that you you don't have before you know Jesus was talking about spiritual matters and being born again and Nicodemus he just he just couldn't understand what what do I need to enter my mother's womb again I'm a grown man she's man I can't even talk to you he said because I'm talking in spiritual terms and you're in physical terms and the two just don't match up well Nicodemus it's not recorded he believed then but later on he did because he was, he was one of the ones that helped take Jesus' body and put it in the tomb. So he did believe later on, but it took him a while to get to that, that place. You know, um, you can be in some church traditions that don't teach that you must be born again. They'll teach you have to join the church. You have to become a member of the church. But that's not being born again. That's just becoming a member of the church. Maybe it gives you privileges in that church depending upon the constitution of how to vote or not vote or, or, or enter into the gossip or I don't, I don't know what it is. But, you know, it, but Jesus said you must be born again. You can have church membership, but it's not being born again. 
Uh, some teach, you know, that uh, uh, your, your, your uh, children need to be baptized when they're infants. And I don't think that hurts anything, but that, that's not, that's not uh, adult, that's not baptism in a sense of you know that you are, that you've been uh, saved. A child doesn't know that, doesn't have any idea. It doesn't hurt to baptize a child, but it, it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, that's not, sal- that's not water baptism as taught in the New Testament. No, it's after you believe, then you are water baptized. And again, it doesn't necessarily hurt, but at the same time, it's not to the level of what sometimes church tradition teaches that. I'm, I'm reminded back of, uh, of church history back in the 1500s where you had uh, the, the church, and it happened to be uh, largely the Catholic church at that time, that was uh, um, fighting against this reformation that is known as the Protestant church. And in the 1500s, you had for the first time the, um, the printing uh, press that began to print the Bible in language that people could read for themselves. So they were no longer dependent upon the priest telling them what the Bible said. They actually were able to read for themselves. And what they came out with was two different interpretations, vastly different. In fact, they began to discover that the priest was actually withholding what the Bible actually said because it was for their gain, selfish gain of the church gain. And so they entered into this reformation. And during that time, many people who began to believe what the Bible said, being born again, being water baptized, and following Christ and putting him first in your life, they were actually burned at the stake or put in a bag and thrown into the water, and their life was done. But they didn't recant, because they had settled. They had convincing proofs that they had settled, that they knew that God was who he said he was, and they knew that they were born again, and they knew that even if they gave their life, they would be with the Lord. It wasn't the end. They had it settled. They had it it fixed up, and I, I read recently statements of, of during that time of people, the statements they made right before they were stepped into the fire, right before they were thrown in. It's incredible to hear just the incredible faith that they stood because they were convinced that Jesus was God and was their Savior and they needed to put him first, even <clears throat> at the place of, uh, of death. Now, the other interesting thing is during that time, the church and the state were married together. In other words, if you, were, uh, if you didn't <clears throat> believe like the church believed, then you were a criminal of the state as well. And that was one of the things that our nation was founded differently, which doesn't mean that you can't be a Christian in government. It just means that there will be no national denomination. That's what it means, because that's what was happening in Europe. It was a national denomination that was married with the, with the government, and so therefore, if you oppose the church, you oppose the government, and, and they were one together and would persecute uh, those that believed in a way that the Bible teaches. And again, we're not there, but uh, some of you would probably argue with me about that statement. <laughs> um, we must, <clears throat> so the second thing is that we must uh, um, be convinced of the evidence. We must examine the evidence. Not only just believe, but examine the evidence. In John 20, 25 through 28, It reads, so the other disciples told him, this is um, Thomas, we've seen the Lord, but he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And so again, Jesus comes in the room and he he does that and he believes. My mind strayed to another Thomas that didn't believe, not this Thomas. Another Thomas named Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson couldn't come to terms with the miracles in the Bible. He couldn't come to terms with the resurrection. And so he actually published his own book called The Moral and Morals and Life of Jesus Christ. And he didn't include any of the miracles and he didn't include the resurrection because he couldn't believe that. I find that ironic because if he's saying that Jesus is the ultimate moral teacher then what you have to conclude is that Jesus lied because 
He's saying that his miracles aren't true or the resurrection isn't true. So really, the title of his book probably should be The Immoral Life of Jesus Christ rather than The Moral Life because he's leaving out the miracles in the resurrection. Thomas Jefferson needed to be born again. He was partially there, maybe like Nicodemus. I don't know if he got there or not, but I hope, I hope he is in heaven. I'd like to have a conversation with him. But he, uh, he obviously was missing it at that point. And I trust, uh, uh, yeah, we'll just leave it there. So Jesus was fully moral. Therefore, all of his miracles and his resurrection are true. And you've got to believe it all or believe nothing. That's basically the simple word we get to. You believe it all or believe nothing. We may not understand it all, but, but believing something and understanding it are two different things. There's things that I believe that I don't understand. I don't understand the Trinity. I mean, I still, I, I, don't, I just don't, I, I don't understand fully grace. I don't understand fully what I have available to me in the righteousness of Christ. I mean, I, I'm probably, I don't know, 50% there, 60 but I think there's parts that I'm still growing in to understand that. And, and that's important for us to realize that, that believing something and understanding something or experiencing something is totally different. But I totally believe today. I've settled it. I'm convinced. But there's things that I don't understand yet. And that's okay. I'm growing in my walk, and I trust that you are too. So based then on what we know, we believe. That's where we're at. Based upon what we know, we believe. Thomas wouldn't believe because there were things missing that he didn't know. And he said, if those things were settled, I would believe. So I have to ask you a question. And, and that is that uh, what are the things, if you're born again this morning, if you say, I'm born again this morning, I've invited Jesus to be my Savior, what are the things that you are unconvinced about? That if somebody would come up to you and try to talk you out of following Christ, that you would actually listen because you haven't settled what you're convinced of to believe that Jesus is the only way and the needed way and you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. What kind of arguments would be brought to you that would be said that would make you question because you have not settled that which you are, that which you believe, you're convinced of? It would be a question to you and I. Because that's happening today. It's called deconstructionism. That many people, and oftentimes it happens with young people, but it can happen to people at any age that they get to the place because they've not settled what they're convinced of, suddenly something comes along and begins to talk and nibble, and because they've not entered into the fullness like Thomas did to settle it once for all, that suddenly they find their faith missing and gone. And they're like, what happened? And the unfortunate thing is sometimes that people that deconstruct never construct anything. They just stay D and they don't ever con. Put it back together. What Thomas did, he put it back together. And my question to you, if there's things that are outliers that you're, that you're unsure of, dig into them. Dig into scripture. Find resources. Settle it because it's worth it. Because we don't know the future of what we're headed into. But we do know this. That God says that we're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and American church, listen to this one. It's in the text. It's in, it's in Revelation. And that we love not our life unto death. All three. That means you're convinced. And you can't be talked out of it. Because you're sure. That's what Jesus did when he came back to the dead, from the dead resurrected he gave them convincing proofs he opened their minds to the scriptures for them to see that they couldn't see before because they weren't born again and after they were born again he's pulling out scripture they go oh yeah i get that oh i didn't understand it that way oh i thought that meant something else and jesus is like pulling out these scriptures that identify who he was and that he truly did uh, 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 predict and it all of them came true, the prophecies regarding his death, burial, and resurrection. And they never saw it before until they were born again. 
And then they begin to get the convincing proofs. That's what he spent the 40 days walking through in order for them to truly settle that they believed. So finishing up here today, what are the initial benefits of being born again? When you say yes to Jesus, what should immediately begin to happen and take place? In John chapter 20, verse 31, it says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. When Jesus came into that upper room, the first thing he brought with him was peace. Peace I leave with you. In fact, he said it three times. He said it in, um, he said it in uh, verse 19, peace. He said it in verse 21, peace I leave with you. He said it again in verse 26 with Thomas, peace I give you. So when Jesus stepped in to the scene and steps into your life, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to experience peace. Because something is settled between you and God that's never been settled before. And that should bring us peace. You've probably had things in your life that were unsettled, open circles, things that needed to be done, even legal matters. And you're like, how is this going to be done? I don't understand anybody knows how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I'm worn out thinking about it. And you've got all these things swirling around. And then suddenly it all comes together. The paper's signed. You know, it's done. It's completed. It's, it's finished. What happens at that moment? Peace. It's like, ah, it's done. That's, that's, that should happen to us when Jesus comes in. That peace that now I am settled with God. I've settled the account. Jesus settled it for me. I place my faith in him. I have peace. Are you experiencing that this morning? If not, you should be. Because that's what Jesus came in the initial born again. The second thing is that we, our sin is forgiven, and now we have the ability to forgive others' sins. You're like, what? Jesus said something <clears throat> right after. Right after he said, receive the Holy Spirit, he makes a statement. It's really interesting and odd, but yet let me unpack it for you, and I think you'll get it. He says in verse 23 of chapter 20, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Forgiven. What in the world is he talking about? In fact, some translations say that if you don't forgive, the sins are, are, if you do forgive, their sins are released. If you don't forgive, the sins are retained. As I begin to wade into this verse, what I begin to understand that we come to God for our sins to be forgiven. And Jesus now says, because your sins are forgiven, I am empowering you to forgive others that sin against you. And if you don't forgive others that sin against you, then that sin that others have committed against you uh, continues to influence your life. It's retained. But if you would choose to forgive when people do things against you that aren't right, that wrong, immoral, whatever it is, maybe they know it, maybe they don't. But if you choose to forgive those that have done things to you, then you're released, you're free, it's gone. What an amazing way to live. Yeah, I, I haven't gotten along with everybody pastoring a church. Okay? 25 years in pastoring, I haven't gotten along with everybody. Okay? There may be news to some of you, but that's the truth. And yet I meet those people, and I, I bless them, and, you know, I, I just, I forgive them, and, and, and I just walk free. And sometimes I meet those people, and they'll come up to me like, uh, Pastor Bobby, we had real differences when I was there. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. Most of the time I just forget. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I forgive you anyhow. And people are carrying this stuff around, and I'm free because I've forgiven them. That's an example of that if we forgive people, then we, it's released over the influence of our life. And if we don't forgive people, it's retained over the influence of our life. And so... The quicker and the easier that you just come and walk in forgiveness, you walk in freedom. You're like, well, who's going to bring them justice if I don't stay mad at them? <laughs> Jesus will. He says in Romans later on, he says, 
he says, leave room for God's wrath. I will repay, saith the Lord. God, I'm done with them. Now they're on your hook. You deal with them. Walk in freedom. Wonderful way to walk. I believe that's what Jesus was saying here in this passage. He said, I'm now empowering you to forgive those that, that hurt you, that do things against you. And when you do, you'll walk in freedom. And if you don't, you will retain that which they've done against you and it will affect your life forever. Wow. So, big deal here. Benefit of being born again. And then finally, is the assurance of eternal life. Let me just say, before I finish up on this statement, that Ephesians 4.32 sums this up. Paul writes, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ has forgave you. We should forgive just as Christ has forgiven us. Well, finally, we come to assurance of eternal life. And the Bible is very clear that we can know that we are born again. John 1.31, again, I read this other times. These things are written that you may believe. But then in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, same writer, different book, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. He doesn't say, I write these things to you that you may guess whether or not you have eternal life. I write these things to you so that you may hope that you have eternal life. I write these things to you that, that, that you, you may speculate that you have eternal life. No. He says, I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Life. Convinced. The proofs are clear. We've bought in. Overcomers, because Jesus shed his blood. Overcomers, because we've said yes to him. And overcomers, that we're willing to put Jesus first in our life, even if it means our own life is taken. Wow. That's what it means to be born again. Are you born again? <laughs> well, partially. <laughs> Uh, no, just kidding. I was like, yeah, I, I, I believe in the blood of Jesus. I believe in the testimony, but I'm not sure about the taking my life part. You got to get all in. It's important to get all in. Not that it'll come to that, but Jesus called us to all or nothing. So the starting places of being born again, we find, first of all, that initially it was the breath of Jesus that was spoken over them. And they were born again. Then subsequently after that, it's when you believe. And Thomas exhibited that. My question, are you born again? Have you believed? Have you made a, a decision to believe in Jesus? That he has done for you what no other human being can do for you. And that is that, that he provided everything necessary for you to come in right relationship with God the Father. There's no other human being. You, I, I, nobody is perfect enough to be able to do that except the one and only perfect one, Jesus. And he says, if you would believe that what I've done for you counts on your behalf, that you'll be born again. Second, is there more evidence that you need to settle the fact that Jesus raised from the dead? He is who he says he is. Do you need to dig into that deeper? Do you need to, to, again, have a conversation with somebody? I just don't know about. Just as Jesus came into the room and he directly answered what Thomas needed, just as this couple left this other church not knowing where they were going to go and come into this church and the pastor say that morning directly the opposite of what they left, directly what they needed to hear, the timing of that, Jesus knows where to direct you and where to send you to get the proof you need to settle once and for all. Thomas was settled. In fact, tradition holds that he went into India, that on the southern um, eastern coast of India, that he took the gospel to India. And there's Christians there today that, that, root, uh, uh, that 
um, you know, go all the way back to when Thomas landed there. And they say that we're Christians today because the Apostle Thomas reached our land. They say he was speared by some of the, those that, that didn't like this new religion coming in. Some, I mean, there's all kinds of speculation about how he died, but the most common one was speared. Some say he was speared five times before he died because of the life that was living in him. Again, the fact is he gave his life for Christ and went to India. So he settled it. The third thing is this, is that God now gives you the ability to forgive those who have hurt you. God now gives you the ability being born again, to forgive those who have hurt you. Maybe one, and maybe two, maybe three. I was, um, I had the privilege of sitting under a missionary that was uh, in Israel for 36 years, and they came off the mission field and joined the staff of the church that I was a part of at that time. And he made this observation in, uh, in counseling people. He said that when I find someone that just has recurring issues in their life and they never get settled, they just they read the Bible, they pray, they get prayed, they, they go through confession, and nothing seems to work. He said, what the Lord showed me is that I take them back to that initial moment of when they invited Jesus in. And I ask them, tell me about that initial moment. And he said, what I find is those that have reoccurring issues, that that moment when they invited Jesus in, they did it for the wrong reason. They did it because somebody was putting pressure on them. They did it because they were in fear. They did it because their spouse drug them up front to say a sinner's prayer. They, they did it because they, um, you know, for all the wrong reasons. And he doesn't tell them, you're not born again. He just simply says this, would you like to say a prayer today after he hears that? Would you like to say a prayer today to settle that Jesus is your Lord? And he said, everybody says, yes, I'd love to do that. And after that gets settled in the right way. See, uh, 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 Jesus said in John 6, he says, no one can come to the Father. No one can come to me unless the Father draws them. We don't have any drawing power within ourselves. God does that. He's the one that draws people. He's the one that calls people. And we just get to be a part of that. Maybe share something or share a life or share a testimony or lead them in a prayer. We just get to be a part of that. But God's the one doing the drawing. He's the one that's doing the pulling. He's the one that's doing the convincing. He's the one doing the convicting. We're not. And when we step into that role, it's just big trouble. It just doesn't go well at all when we step into God's role. So we have a role and God has a role. But the counselor said, that when they settle for the right reasons why they invited Jesus in, he says those reoccurring issues stop. They just stop because he's in for the right reasons and not the wrong. What an amazing, amazing reality for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to, to really uh, not gloss over this last week and 40 days that you were with the disciples and even beyond it ended up being 120 that you were with and you revealed yourself to many more than that and today God I pray that um, we would examine our own lives and first of all ask ourselves uh, if we consider ourselves born again are we convinced are we convinced that Jesus is who he said he is are we convinced that that he uh, died and, and it was buried and rose again, are we convinced that we need him to see the kingdom of God? Are we convinced that, that things are not going to make sense spiritually unless we are born again? Father, I pray that you would help us to settle what's unsettled at this moment. And Father, I also pray for those here today that <clears throat> have been um, realizing there's people they need to forgive and wondering whether or not we have the ability to do that. And I thank you today that you laid that out there when, when your early disciples became born again. And he said to them, now you have the power. You have the power to either forgive that person that hurt you or hold on to it and let it affect you.
for the rest of your life. And Father, I pray that those listening here, maybe online, would maybe for the first time realizing I've been holding on to someone that I need to forgive because I want to walk in freedom. Thank you, Lord, for these moments you bring us to so that we can truly, truly know you and walk in the freedom as a son or daughter that you've designed us to be from the beginning. In Jesus' name, amen.